Okay, so <clears throat> great to see you folks again, and, and uh, apologies again for last week's uh, last minute postponement to those health issues. Um, so today's uh, discussion is going to uh, build on our, our coverage of adjunctions from uh, a variety of, of uh, perspectives. Um, we've talked about adjunctions as kind of bringing together um, in a single topic, as it were, um, a bunch of, of key concepts um, and key, key useful um, outcomes um, associated with, uh, with category theoretic perspectives. And uh, this provides us uh, a great deal of, of opportunity for expanding our understanding of, of basic um, category theory from this perspective. Um, and today really embarks on the, um, the first step of what will be a multi-session journey on one particular uh, topic of great uh, practical and theoretic significance uh, associated with adjunctions, uh, which is um, their linkage to, to monads. Now, um, uh, monads, uh, play a, a very important role uh, both in, uh, in category theory, uh, providing these encodings of universal algebras, um, which are, are very, uh, very powerful and very flexible. Um, but they also play, uh, at the same time, uh, a really important role in higher level functional programming. And it's one of the things that, um, and one of the reasons why to us as computer scientists, Monads uh, have have such a, uh, a large role to play in a discussion of applied category theory. Uh, their linkage to adjunctions is quite direct, um, as we'll see. Um, uh, every adjunction is associated with a monad and with a co-monad, uh, and indeed, uh, one of the very definitions of adjunctions uh, highlights. Uh, the natural transformations that serve as respectively the, the unit, um, sort of the neutral element as it were with respect to a monad and, um, and the uh, co-unit um, for, for the co-monad. So uh, every adjunction gives us uh, a monad. And in fact, every monad is associated not just with one but with a family of, of adjunctions. And we'll be exploring both sides of that equation today. Um, this topic uh, is a challenging one to, uh, to really address in a unified fashion, I find, because monads can be approached uh, from a very uh, nitty gritty, um, software engineering perspective uh, in a fruitful way. Um, they can be approached from an extremely abstract um, category theoretic perspective, uh, which is uh, equally fascinating and, uh, and quite insightful. But I find it's, it's fairly rare that um, at once uh, there's a look at monads, which um, provides theoretical grounding uh, or theoretical uh, sort of understanding and practical grounding. Um, and I'm going to try to thread that needle today um, and, and weave together these two levels of description um, in, a, in at least a first cut on it. Um, this is going to be uh, an introduction to the topic uh, that spans those two levels. And uh, I'm planning subsequent sessions to go into um, to particular subtopics, some with more of a practical bent and some with more of a theoretical bent that will um, hopefully knit together these, these two perspectives. Uh, and uh, I think what you'll find is if you have in mind the practical manifestation um, instantiation of monads within a computational setting, uh, with reference points like the the power set monad or the the monad associated with partial functions, commonly called the maybe monad or the writer monad, 
um, the state monad, you'll find that um, a lot of these concepts and category theory end up becoming a lot more uh, concrete and practical. Um, and so um, I'm going to try to, to sort of address uh, that interweaving as a key part of my exposition, uh, in part because I believe it's so important not only for motivation, but for, um, but for understanding. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, give it a try uh, first time through and, and we'll have a chance to, um, uh, to, to expand on this in coming sessions. Okay, so um, I'm going to be uh, going through a, a set of topics here. Um, the, the first, um, uh, first set of which are, are really listed here. We're gonna be talking about uh, computational effects and the desire to capture computational effects um, as a key motivator for monads, but with the reflection that it's really the composition of constructs that that uh, offer or that return or that they're associated with these effects um, uh, that that motivates monads. Uh, functors by themselves provide uh, a lot of power in capturing computational effects, but by themselves they don't afford this easy way to compose and uh, to divide and conquer, as it were. And we'll see that um, that it's that desire to compose things. Um, that compose functions um, each associated with computational effect into one overall structure that uh, where monads uh, really come come to the fore. We're going to be talking about um, monads as they pop out of adjunctions and reflecting on the fact that monads are are these endofunctors. They're a, a functor, a mapping from a category to itself. So it'll bring something like an int to a maybe event, or a bool to a list of bools, um, for example. Uh, and we'll see these natural transformations, uh, which are so critical to the definition of an adjunction as, um, as playing a, a role here in creating these elements of, of the adjunction. So turning a given int into a singleton list, for example. Or, or turning into a singleton set for the power set monad. Um, and we'll, we'll actually see that that unit natural transformation, which is so critical for adjunctions, has a very practical role to play uh, within um, creation of, of these um, monadic values, where those monadic values then serve as a, as a unit, um, as a, a neutral element. Uh, in a monoid sense, uh, when it comes to um, um, this monoidal multiplication that's associated with the join operation for monads. We'll talk about Kleisley categories, where Kleisley categories provide a very nice illustration of um, how we use categories in a flexible way um, that transcends our normal old chestnut of, of thinking about, um, about Func uh, morphisms as functions. Um, uh, that they, they provide a twist to that that um, is really quite useful to get your head around. And Kleisley categories uh, basically lay out for us um, the nature of the uh, of the challenge that we have to address with uh, with monads in terms of composing these these functions that return computational effects. Uh, so within a Kleisley category, we're gonna be dealing with functions, but the functions between type A and B, say between int and bool, are not going to be functions from int to bool. They're gonna be functions from int to say maybe a bool for a particular monad uh, across the board, across that entire category. Um, and a, a morphism in this category from, uh, from double to int um, would be, one from double to, to a maybe event. Um, so the Kleisley category will be um, a category that kind of characterizes those um, effect bearing functions. And um, we'll see that there's a composition operator in there which um, composes these arrows 
or these morphisms to compose a, a third morphism, just as is always required for a category. Uh, we always need to be able to compose by the laws of, of being a legitimate category, separate um, morphisms that go end to end, A to B and B to C, we need to be able to compose them into one from A to C. And indeed, uh, the composition operator will be given by the, um, uh, by the classic composition, the, the, the fish operator. Um, now, the final topic that I'm hoping to get to today, as time allows, is um, gets to the heart of this kind of um, famously opaque characterization of monads, um, which has been turned into a cottage industry of uh, t-shirts and um, other paraphernalia, um, in which monads are, are characterized as monoids in the category of endofunctors. Um, and you'll see that what we think of as a, mo as a monad um, in a way that at a practical level, it's not obvious where there's a monoidal operation, you know, there's a monoidal plus or monoidal times. It turns out there, there is, um, it's just, it's a different notion of time. So when we have a list of lists, uh, for example, we can turn it into a list by flattening. When we have a, um, a set of sets, we can turn it into a single set by taking the union of all the things in the, in the outer set. Um, and, and so it is, that's the multiplication in a, in a monoidal sense. Um, so and it turns out the unit of the multiplication is the result of the unit natural transformation, like a singleton list or a singleton, singleton set. Um, so if we get to it, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll cover that today, otherwise uh, next time. But I want to begin with this issue of computational effects. And, and, and that's partly because, you know, we're here as computer scientists and one of the recurrent um, concerns you hear expressed over the years about um, the use of, of functional programming and its viability is um, this fact that our programs, you know, have to do a lot more than just return values. Um, it, it might be how it's, how it's said. They can't just be, surely they can't just be a bunch of functions just with no side effects that return values. After all, how are we going to deal with IO? How are we going to deal with, with logging? How are we going to deal with the sort of side effects needed to maintain state across multiple, across multiple functions? Um, how are we going to how are we going to deal with randomness? How are we going to deal with uh, having distributions over things? Um, how are we going to deal with non-probabilistic randomness um, or, or non-determinism? Um, how are we going to deal with values that you know, can't be determined just by the value you pass in? They have to be set by context of some sort. Um, how are we going to deal with the fact we don't have exceptions? Uh, we can't have our program fail at at places uh, silently and, and lead to all sorts of errors. Um, and you know how are we gonna deal with um, more flexible control flow, the ability for a program to, to, to sort of um, uh, be uh, execute in a, in a very flexible fashion, perhaps according to aspects of data that, that are stored sometimes in tables. Um, uh, all of these things I've just mentioned could be considered types of computational effects. And um, computational effects uh, broaden our notion of, of sort of what, what a function can do by including these additional, additional um, uh, capabilities or functionalities uh, that are very frequently used in practical software engineering after all it's hard to imagine programming without some sort of input output, um, the ability to take input from the user, the ability to put out things. Um, now, in order to discuss this, it turns out we can capture all these computational effects in a purely functional way, uh, in a way that, um, that leverages these constructs of category theory um, at a way that will be very familiar to you at one set of practical level. Um, and throughout this, set of sessions because they weave together the 
practical with the um, uh, with with the uh, category theoretic perspective, um, it it won't surprise you that we're we're going to be recur uh, coming back recurrently to a uh, a category. Um, what's sometimes referred to as a category. Uh, more technically, it's a pseudo category or quasi category. Um, that we might use to model our programming language. And for simplest, but without uh, privileging it, we'll deal here, deal here with Hask, Haskell, okay? Um, but please reflect on the fact that we could come up with similar pseudo categories or quasi categories for other languages um, and, and characterize them similar. The main reason this is not a true category uh, an absolutely central reason is that um, we have this nasty issue of non-termination, uh, whereby when we say a function returns a float, well, maybe it returns a float if it ever returns. Otherwise, we might have to say, well, okay, if it returns a float or bottom, it returns something that's that's not any value, um, and uh, it's really that issue of non-termination that that gets in the way of total categorization here. But imagine that we take it at face value. Uh, after all, just like we model things uh, approximately in the world for our simulation models, so we can model programming languages in a rough way with a, with a category, pretty good way. Um, and here, we're gonna be dealing with this category Hask where the objects are types, uh, and the, so all the possible values in int, for example, are here, all the possible values in float are here. And the functions are, are the morphisms are functions between those types. So for example, we might have a ceiling function that takes a float and goes to an int. We might have uh, an is even function that takes an int and goes to a bool, right? Um, uh, might have an is negative that takes a float and goes to a bool. And uh, if you look around this, uh, while I've just done this in a fairly ad hoc way, you'll, you'll find that uh, some of these types are not basic types. They're, they're not, you know, the bools, ints, floats, doubles, chars, et cetera, but rather they are, um, they're composite types. They're, they're um, for example, additive types of things. They're, they're pairs of multiplicative types of things. So for example, we know, might have a pair of a bool and a double um, as a type. Uh, we might have a function from uh, one thing to another. And, and this is, is an indication it's a closed category. We actually have objects that reflect the types associated with all the morphisms in it as well. Um, so it's, a, it's in fact a Cartesian closed category because uh, it, it, it can describe itself in terms of its morphisms. So the objects here are types and the morphisms are functions between types. Um, and uh, we're gonna be using this as our point of reference going forward. We've kind of informally talked about it in the context of natural transformations, but here we're gonna be uh, embracing it more centrally. Um, okay, now, if we think to this issue of computational effects, and we think to how functions could capture computational effects while not straying from their ability to be pure, to, to just return a, a value uh, deterministically based on the input. Um, we can reflect on the fact that this common struct, a construct that we've used in category theory um, of a functor can extend a value uh, a value category with computational effects. So the idea is, look, um, we could have a we could have a functor like um, like a list functor, for example, uh, which could take an int and map it to a, a list of possible ints. Um, although we'll come back to it as a as a monad. We could do the same thing with, with any functor, like maybe, for example, we could take an int and, and make it a, a maybe event um, by expanding it with the possibility that that there might be nothing there. It might not have anything. Um, 
we could take a uh, float and we could turn it into a, a set of possible floats. In fact, any functor we could apply to any of these types and get back a, a sort of broadened type. And by using this, we can, we can capture a lot of these, in fact, all of these computational effects. So instead of just dealing with a simple int, we can deal with a maybe event, or we can deal with a set of possible ints, or we can deal with a list of possible, a sequence of possible, possible ints, maybe indicating multiple return values or, or no return values at all if it's an empty list. Um, uh, we, could, we could take that int and we could map it with the functor to an int in a string where the string um, could indicate if, if we had some problem in, in um, uh, computing that int or where, where um, it might document the occurrence of, of uh, it might log what happened when we computed it. So with functors, we can take types and we can map them to these elaborated values, these kind of embellished values, these generalized values um, that can capture computational effects. Um, and so this functor, remember a functor maps all objects in one, ob uh, in one category to objects in a different category and maps the morphisms, right? Uh, systematically over. Um, it, it lifts the morphisms to apply um, if there's a morphism from A to B in the source category, it lifts it to apply from F of A to F of B in the target category. Now here, these functors we're dealing with are from Hask to Hask. They're back to itself. Well, they'll, so they'll map all the objects in Hask. In int, they'll map to a maybe event. A float, they'll map to a maybe a float. A double, they'll map to a maybe of double. A, a maybe of integer, they'll map to a maybe of maybe of integer. A, uh, you know, uh, uh, a function that goes from an integer to a maybe of integer, it'll map that to a maybe of a function from an integer to a maybe of integer. And similarly, there's a separate functor for uh, power set. So we could have um, ints mapped to power sets of ints where, so instead of having just one, one stinking int, we can have a whole set of <laughs> stinking ints. Um, we, instead of having one float, we could have a whole, a whole uh, set of floats. So the, the source category and the target category here will be Hask. It'll be an endo functor, um, much as an endoscope is something that looks inside, inside you. Um, it's kind of operating inside, much as we talked about a modeling of endogenous behavior, behavior that occurs within the, the model. Here it is, we're dealing with endo functors. Okay, um, so in this context, we can map these um, um, the, these these values, and uh, and that's good. Um, we could take what would be a stinking ant and turn it into a to a list of of stinking ants, right? Um, uh, so that's that's great, and in fact, uh, we could do that uh, systematically for like um, taking uh, and and this is uh, just an indication of of how we might you know, generalize some of these. Um, uh, well, well, sorry, I, I shouldn't have shown that. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a second because some of the, it's illustrating this particular, what's on this slide. So the idea is we can lift values by this functor. We can, we can take it in to replace it by, by, a, um, by a, a list of events or a, a power set events or maybe event and same thing for floats, et cetera. That's great. Um, but remember, functors operate not only in objects, they operate on, on morphisms. They map every morphism. And, and here the functor is going from has to it helps, has to has. So it's gonna map, for example, the is negative morphism from float to bool to be something which goes from whatever float is mapped to by the functor. So let's say a maybe a float uh, to a maybe a bool or a list of floats to a list of pools for a different functor. So there, instead of being a mapping from float to bool, we might have uh, a lifting of this function to operate on lists. We F map it over to operate on lists so that uh, there's a, 
a, a variant of is negative that can take elements uh, of a list of floats and turn them into a list of booleans by classifying if each and every one of them is negative. Or it'll operate on a maybe a float and turn it into a maybe a bool by indicating, well, if that maybe actually has a value, we'll, we'll just see is it negative or not and turn it into a, you know, a, if we have a just of negative one, it'll turn into a just of false. If we had a, uh, if the float was plus 1.0, we have just of 1.0 gets turned into a just of true. Um, and, uh, and for a list, it would be similar or do it piecewise. So with a functor, not only can we map values like a float into a list of floats, we can map functions. Um, and these functions, instead of operating on the original values, like is negative operating on float to map it to a bool, it's operating on the lifted values, the values as maps, so a list. So we have this analog to is negative that works on lists. It maps lists to lists, lists of, in, of floats to lists of bools. Okay, um, and and this is really useful. Um, so for example, with um, an effect that might encode possible failure, we can capture that with a maybe, um, uh, or or partial function would be a better way to put that. It's a partial function, um, uh, and here. This, uh, this partial function um, might have no value at all. Um, it might, might have a value. So we can go and systematically um, map. Um, if we have something that's, that operates on the original types, we can turn it in via the functor by F mapping it into something that operates on the mappings of these types. A list of floats to a list of bools, maybe a of floats to maybe of bools, a power set of floats to a power set of bools, et cetera. Um, and um, that's useful. Um, whether uh, regardless of these computational effects, it might be useful. So for example, one might encode partial values, values could be missing or present, and it would map you know, that into this. I'm using plus here in the, in the context of um, disjoint union, uh, it's either this or this, or more generally something we'll see called co-product. When, when I pay off some tech debt and introduce you to products and co-products and the associated universal constructions and category theory, we'll, we'll see why this makes a world of sense in terms of its, uh, in terms of its notation. But here we could have A is a type, maybe it's int, and we can have either an int or nothing and it's mapped to either a bool or nothing, for example. Or to go back to the example I was saying, a float or nothing is mapped to a bool or nothing by this thing is negative. And if this original thing is nothing, we just say, well, it's, we have no bool value. Uh, if, if the original thing was like 1.0, we'll, we'll say, yes, we have, we, we, we have true, uh, we have just of true. Um, and same thing, you know, if we have a log value, if we store a, if we store a float with a string that describes um, how it was derived, we can map that to something transparently that's a bool that that keeps that same string as to how it was uh, derived, and and that bool um, would just be the result, say, of uh, of mapping it through this: uh, is it negative or not? And we can do the same with context dependent values by passing in this thing called the environment or E. Um, and, uh, and basically uh, this would be a value of A which might consult the symbol table or this environment to, to determine some values uh, that it needs to, to give a value for itself. And we can map it to a value over B. Um, and power sets we can map uh, in probabilistic outcomes. If you watch that video by Paolo Peroni, um, you, could, you can um, uh, learn something about probabilistic outcomes where we have a distribution over possible values of A. And given lifting of this function, we can map it over into a distribution over Bs uh, if we just have a function that goes A to B. We've seen this before in our 
characterization of functors, right? We can lift a functor uh, from the source domain to the, uh, to the domain as mapped to by the functor. In fact, every functor has to be able to do that, to be a legit functor. To be a legitimate functor, it needs to be able to, to map in this sort of way, uh, not just objects to objects, but morphisms to morphisms. So this lifted function is useful. It, um, it, it passes on computational effects. If it's given a computational effect, it can pass it on, but it doesn't originate it, right? It, we're, we're not taking an int and saying, for example, this function can't be computed on this int. Maybe we give square root a minus one, for example. We, we can't easily use this fact to, to say, oh, there's no value of square root for this input. That's what we'd like to be able to do with the possible failure um, uh, for a partial function. You say it doesn't, doesn't work like that. Or we'd like to be able to have a, a function which returns a log message, which indicates how it was computed in it, or that performs some side effect, or that, that has some non-deterministic result probabilistically. Um, we can't really do that here. All we can do is kind of map from one to the other. It reflects the fact that, look, the function that we're lifting is from X to Y. It doesn't know about any computational effect uh, in Y. It, all it knows about is Y. So if we have this function is negative, yeah, we can lift that to operate a list of floats to list of bools. Great. But we can't have a given float return a list of, of bools. Um, this lifted function doesn't originate these computational effects. It's not originating the occurrence of failure. It's not signaling an exception or, or a failed computation. It's not indicating a whole that each um, float maps to a whole set of possibilities like the complex conjugates associated with it. Um, okay, so in order to think about that, originating these effects, we're still in good hands with this functor we can, we can do something quite useful, quite clever, right? We can, instead of having a function A to B, we can have a function from A to these generalized Bs, these embellished Bs, these elaborated Bs, these, these Bs that have greater tricks up their sleeve, um, where some of those tricks are indicated by, by this here, by these functors here. Given that we have a functor, it can turn any type, any old type, an int, for example, it can turn it a maybe event. It could turn a double into a maybe of double. It could turn a character into a maybe of character. Why don't we have our function, for example, that square root function, take a float and it will return a maybe of float, um, which could be could be a float if, if we gave it 4.0 or return 2.0, great. But maybe if we give it, but it, we might give it minus one and 1.0 and, and minus 1.0 and it, it would give nothing as a result. Now that would be expanding its repertoire, right? It's, it's expanding its repertoire. All we were doing in this previous one is, is lifting it to apply element wise to each of the list of floats we, we, we list the bools. It, each of those is negative applications didn't for each of those elements didn't have a greater repertoire. Now we're now we've expanded the repertoire by having a a float lead to a, a maybe of of a float. Now we can have more diversity in our results. Um, or maybe you know perhaps it will return a um, a, a a list of, of of floats, for example. So maybe if we say what's the square root of four, it'll return two and minus two, because after all, squaring either of them could yield four, right? Um, so here we're, we're you know, kind of these generalized values. We're not just returning a single B, we're returning a set of, we're returning a, 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 a more generalized set of possibilities. Maybe it's determinist and non-deterministic. Uh, it's a some subset of, of Bs. Um, maybe it's a, um, it's a distribution over Bs that, that says, you know, what, what is the probability of getting different Bs? Now we're talking, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're originating this computational effect. We're taking in an A, 
And that can expand to a set of possible values or, or these generalized values. And we can go to town with this. It's great. It's great. Um, so for example, for logging, we can have a function that, that normally goes from A to B and instead will return B with some string on it. Or, or, or maybe we, we want to capture some side effect. Um, and it has to be a pure function. So it has to return the same thing every time but we're going to capture the side effect in the very value we'll return. We'll talk about this more next time in our next session, but basically we will return the same function every time, but this function every time that we return is a mapping from state to a return value. And this mapping um, is going to basically be able to take in a state and return potentially a different state, okay? Um, these are the, the types of these things. For possible failure, what used to take in a, an A and return a B will instead be able to say nothing. That'll be for a partial function. Um, and for non-deterministic values that re return a possible subset of Bs, you know, any, any possible set of Bs, et cetera. I think you get the idea. For lists, we could, for example, uh, return a list, uh, something goes from A to B, we could return a list of, of Bs. And this is quite nice, right? Uh, very, very nice. And all of these follow this pattern of mapping, you know, taking, taking instead of returning B, we return F of B. That's wonderful. Now we have these functions that have greater repertoire, that have greater flexibility, greater generality. They return more generalized values. That's wonderful. Um, and, you know, this is, this is something which, is at once quite practical, right? Um, and, and theoretically pleasing. We, you know, we could have a safe square root and uh, return nothing if it's illegal, otherwise uh, return the value. And, and you could see these for, for all, of, all of these different items. Sometimes for, I've characterized them with a bit of pseudocode. Sometimes I've characterized them with, uh, with text here, but it, it carries across the board. Whoa. Um, uh, that that we can capture these uh, these effects, and it's quite quite pleasing, quite pleasing uh, that we can express this greater repertoire for something that was a function of this sort by just expanding its return value, and that's wonderful. The problem is the problem with that by itself. We're relying on simply a plain old functor, is that. It doesn't by itself provide compositionality. Um, so it's, it's great that we can take these functions and expand them to this, but how are we going to have one function depend on another? So if we, for example, have a, a reciprocal of a square root to use an example from one of Bartosz's videos, um, uh, you know, the, the square root operation will return a, instead of returning a, a B, a, a double, it will return a maybe a, maybe a double, right? Um, and, and the reciprocal therefore is gonna need to be able to work with this, with this value that could be a, a nothing or it could be a legitimate double. And how are we gonna have it work with it? How is it gonna take in that value? Do we have to go through and modify all of these functions to take in values of, uh, of like f of a and return f of b or, or do, we, do we have some other recourse uh, if we have to string them together? Um, so these functors provide us this great step forward. We can expand the spaces of our types to capture additional, uh, additional types of results. And we can expand the behaviors of our functions to, to return greater, have greater repertoire. Um, and we can also by lifting functions, the functor domain, we could have them um, pass, uh, pass on computational effects. Um, uh, however, um, we frequently need to compose these things. And you know, composition is central within software engineering. We divide and conquer. Uh, we, we want separation of concerns. We want to build our programs in ways that are, that are uh, 
well structured so that different spheres of concerns are separated out in different areas of a program and sometimes in different programming languages. We want to take a complex problem and divide it up into pieces, solve them, and, and sort of choreograph the results. Um, we need to divide it up so different people can work on it or to allow it to evolve, different areas of it to evolve at, at different times. So the UI elements evolve perhaps faster than the core business logic. Um, we want to be clear about what the dependencies are. And, and by carving things off into functions, we can document preconditions, post conditions. We can run unit tests and test suites for these. And we could clearly document what they require. And it's often very clear from the nature of the parameters passed to them. Um, we can extend a, a system like this, not only modify it, but extend it more readily. Um, we can substitute in different uh, components for a given uh, set of functions if we want to retarget to a different platform or what have you. We can use abstraction to allow us to, uh, to, to have greater versatility. Um, and we can have software contracts that are characterized in terms of these functions. And that's all great and good, but we, the, the key to dividing it to pieces is we have to put those pieces together. And the way we put those pieces together is through composition. If we take a single monolithic function, a big hairball, and we divide it into functions f, g, and h, we need to be able to compute f, and then g, and then h, uh, and, and have them work together nicely. Now, uh, composition uh, is, is central to our goals, and so we need a way of composing these sort of functions. If we've divided it up, so f, g, and h, each take one input, and to capture their effects, return a generalized value, they need to play nicely together. G needs to somehow play with the value returned by F that's of type F of B, returned by little f, um, that's of type capital F of B. Um, and it needs to turn that into its own effect um, uh, to pass on to, to, the, to um, uh, lowercase uh, h. And, um, you know, I, I splatted down here some things that we commonly do in our modeling or other cases. I mentioned this reciprocal, the square root. Um, but, you know, in other cases, we take the eigenvectors of a matrix, we put them into a, a matrix themselves, uh, and we take the matrix inverse and we multiply matrix. This in the context, perhaps, of uh, coordinate transformation associated with symmetry transforms. Um, and matrix diagonalization, as is used in linear systems analysis beautifully. Um, or maybe we you know, filter a, a population of people according to age, and we take the mean income. But we have to deal with the fact that there might be zero people within this age category. Or maybe we find all the agents within a certain range, and we want to compute their infection prevalent, the prevalence of infection among them. But there ain't no agents within that range, right? Um, we have a lot of these cases where we, we need to do one thing after the other. Those who took my 2016 course uh, uh, or its 2017 version on you know, big data processing and Spark will remember perhaps this uh, Scala uh, fragment um, where we were successfully processing in a pipeline as is typical in, in big data um, uh, engineering. Um, we have a pipeline which processes one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Modern software engineering and modern high performance software engineering, including in, in uh, the context of data science is all about composition. It's all close to the heart of what we need to do in software engineering to do our separation of concerns or divide by and conquers, et cetera. The challenge here uh, is that uh, we need to be able to compose these functions a to f of b, and separately b to f of c to get something that's a to f of c. Um, and you know it, it gets messy, but um, one way to do that, if we have a to f of b, um, and we want to have a map, if the second function needs to produce an f of c, one way to do it is to take in an f of b as an argument and produce an f of c. The problem is. Uh, if we do that, we deal with a lot of boilerplate. 
um, case after case, we're going to be dealing with this boilerplate, which is duplicated. So if we're dealing with partial functions, or possible failure or, or logging, um, you know, if, if all of our functions need to be expanded to take in an F, an F of an argument, so instead of going F of uh, A to F of B, if, if to take in values from a previous function that had computational effects, it'd have to be F of A to F of B because F of A was produced by something earlier. If we have to do that, we're dealing with a huge amount of boilerplate. Um, we're dealing with, for example, safe square root is taking in now a maybe and it's returning a maybe. But um, this should say just, um, gosh, this should say just of, of, of square root of x. Sorry, thought I'd fix that. Um, um, here, you know, it has to take in a maybe and return a maybe. And this is great, but um, if nothing is passed into it, it's gonna return nothing. There's nothing it can do. But the same thing is true with safe reciprocal as well. Um, oh my gosh, this is, this is a horrible. Um, so this should be, I thought I fixed this, all right. Um, um, so, so this is the same basic pattern that safe reciprocal, if it's given nothing, there's nothing it can do. So it has to return nothing. Safe tangent, same thing. Safe negate, same thing. If, if these things are past, past maybes um, that are nothing, they all return nothing. Um, with logging, it's kind of a similar thing. If things are passed in a value, which is say a logged double, um, no matter what the function is, it's going to need to take the log from that and append it to what we have now to form the complete log before returning. So we have a function log negate that needs to return the negate of a value and an indication that it is the negation. And here, if we need to modify it to take in a maybe, or sorry, a logged value as input, and return a log value as output, um, then it's going to need to take the log from that input and and combine it with its own log to return to return the complete log um, together with the negated value. But so will square. Square will have to do the same thing, and so will sine. It will have to do the same thing. So we get this boilerplate code that's um, that that's. Uh, sort of accreted here uh, across these different uh, across these different functions. So if you if by dealing if in order to deal with this issue of compositionality, this need to take an A to F of B in a and another function that takes the results of that and goes to an F of C, if that second function needs to take an F of B and map to F of C, we're going to have a huge amount of, of duplicate because fundamentally there's common semantics, common logic here that all of them share. There's common standard needs that all of them share dealing with an F of B as input. And it's common for a given monad, we have the same boilerplate that's going to turn up in every one of those functions. Um, so here we have two functions, F of F and G, and we want to be able to compose them doing something better than having G always just modified across our entire code to take an F of B to an F of C. Uh, we want to we wanna be able to write our functions in ways that focus on the job at hand, return a computational effect for this job, and, and that don't have to deal with all the sundry logic of dealing with the computational effects from, from earlier ones. So F should go from A to F of B, and it can return the log for that operation. G from B to F of C, it returns the log from that operation. And we wanna be able to somehow compose them um, or maybe A to F of B you know, can fail. It's a partial function and B to F of C can fail. Maybe F is, oh, is um, safe square root and uh, it's, it's taking the square root. So it can fail for negative values. Uh, G maybe is the reciprocal. So it can fail for values given to it of zero. Um, and we just want them to concentrate on what causes 
you know, the partial function for them, the logic of the partial function, and then somehow knit them together. So the question is, how do we knit them together to something that goes from A to F of C? It, it takes in an A, as is seen here, and it returns a, a, uh, a value that reflects the computational effects that occurred anywhere in F and anywhere in G. Well, if we think about this, um, we, can, we can get close to this by taking F, and F returns an F of B. G doesn't take an F of B, but it takes a B. And so what thing we could do to have G operate on F of Bs is to lift it using F. So if we lift G, we raise it to um, with, with F, we map G via F, um, just like we can lift is negative, which got, went from float to bool to instead operate on list of floats to list of bools by applying an element wise, we could lift G with F and get something that now, sub, then in operating of the result of F, it will turn it F of an F of C because G takes a, a B to an F of C. So if we lift it with F, it'll take an F of B. That's great. It ate the result of F and return an F of C. Oh man. Um, so now we've got an F of F of C. We kind of dug ourselves deeper in some ways. Um, well, that's, that's interesting. At least we've composed them. We haven't gotten something that's an F of C yet. We've got an F of F of C. Um, so like a list of List events, or maybe maybe events, or or a uh, uh, power set of a power set events. So now we just need a way of taking this an f of f of c and turning it into an f of c. Um, so it turns out that monads will provide exactly that, and it's called join um, or mu in a category theoretic uh, concept uh, in a context. Um, but we also want to you know, if, if we want to approach this rigorously, if you've learned to think about composition a category theoretic way, you'll, you'll be wondering like, okay, well, okay, we have composition of F and G, that's all nice and good, that's great. But how are we, what's the unit of composition? Like what's the, the value that when you compose it with anything else just gives that thing back? Uh, there must be this identity element that we'd like for a composite to play nicely. And we'd like it to be associative. And really we'd like it to kind of be a category to be, to be nice. And in fact, there is such a category and it's called the Kleisley category, okay? So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna take a look at the structure of the Kleisley category, but first I need to remind you of a couple of things here. Okay, so first of all, it bears reflecting that all these functors we've been talking about have been from hask to the hask. They're endo functors. They went and they took, you know, ints way back here. They took ints to maybe events, which are also in hask. They took float to maybe a float. They took double to maybe of double. Um, so they're all functors from some category C to a category C, okay? Um, now, I told you monads, as a sneak preview, we're gonna give you this ability to, to deal with all these needs here. They're gonna map an F of F of C to an F of C. They're gonna have this identity associated with them and it's gonna be associative. Those are the features of a monad. Um, and, we're going to have this Kleisley category, which um, is going to basically have arrows that are these types of operations. Okay, um, and this Kleisley category will um, will allow us to compose these things nicely. Uh, we'll have Kleisley composition in which any of those can be composed. Um, and in fact, there's this nice relationship between the base category C, say Hask and the Kleisley category for it, there's an adjunction between them. Um, uh, and in fact, there's two um, adjunctions, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay, I wanna remind you about natural transformations. 
Um, and uh, then we'll get on to this uh, Kleisley category. Where's my Kleisley category? Here's the Kleisley category. Um, gosh, I'm going to bring that earlier just so we can we can uh, talk about that a little bit. Um, so give me a second. It's more natural, I think, if I do this here after all. So this is the Kleisley category, okay? And to get a full explanation of this, we'll, we'll need to understand it. But the idea is we have a category, a base category C. This is Hask over here on the right, okay? And so A is a, might be int and bool might, and, and B might be bool. Um, uh, C might be char, right? Um, D might be double. Uh, I'm on a roll here. Um, so uh, here we have functions in this category. This is our base category. This is standard Hask, right? So maybe G from a bool to a character. Oh man, um, maybe it says you know if if uh, uh, if that bool is true, return a happy face character. If bool is false, return a sad face character. Um, had to pull that one out of a hat. Um, so G here is like, you know, emoji or something like that. Um, uh, or is that an emoticon? I, I guess it's an emoticon. Um, uh, and G is a standard old bog simple function from bool to character, okay? Um, now it's, th there's a mapping to the Kleisley category for that. There's an analog and that's G star. And what is G star? Well, G the, over in the Kleisley category, the objects here are the same as the objects in our base category. So we have int in our base category and we have int over here in the Kleisley category. We have bool, we have bool. Great. We have char, we have char. We have double, we have double. Same objects. The functor is identity on objects, this, this left functor, this, the, these blue arrows are identity on objects. You can see this big arrow indicating the, the direction of the adjunction is left, it's left. So the left functor is identity on objects. It just maps B to B, or we call it B sub T here to avoid confusion, okay. Now, however, um, G to be mapped over, um, is mapped into a G star. So G is this emoticon thing that, that maps bools to characters. And G's analog over in the Kleisley category is G star. That's great. But G star is actually not something which is from bools to characters. It's something which is from bools to maybe of character. Okay, um, so so it, it maps it to a maybe of character. And so G star is this thing shown here. It's this diagonal arrow. Um, I've got to clean this up to somehow orient it, but it's this diagonal arrow from B to T of C. T here might be maybe, for example. Um, and this arrow from B to C is, is not a function from B to C. It's a function from B to T of C, and T is the name for the monad. So it's like maybe of C, okay? Maybe of character. Um, and you might think, well, wait a minute, this is whacked out, right? Um, arrows, you might think, look, the definition of an arrow is that it has to be a function that goes from the source to the target. So like, how can we have G star is, it's not from bools to characters, it's from bools to, to maybe of characters, but it goes to characters. Well, get out of that mindset. Remember, arrows can be all sorts of things in category theory. They have to be well-defined. They have to live according to rules, but they can be all sorts of things. Remember, remember the category where our arrows were in a partial order and an arrow indicated one thing is less than another thing, right? Um, we, we had arrows that indicated if A divided B, Arrows don't have to be a function from, from you know, B to C. An arrow from B to C doesn't have to be a function from B to C. It could be a function from B to something else, um, something else associated with C. And so here, an arrow from one, 
one object to another, say from X to Y, is actually a morphism in the original category Hask from X to T of Y, to, to like maybe of Y. Um, and so these are exactly our morphisms, or so-called Kleisley morphisms here. So they're things from A to, now we called it T here. We've replaced F by T because it's a monad. And, and category theorists always refer to monads as T. Um, and so it's A to T of B is this morphism that returns a computational effect. B to F of C returns this computational effect, right? So that's what these morphisms are. These are computational effect bearing morphisms, effect featuring morphisms. These are generalized morphisms where we have an int to a bool mapping where it returns a maybe of bool. And uh, here, one from bool to character that returns a maybe of character. Uh, that's what these are. These are these computational effect generalized bearing comp uh, generalized uh, generalized functions, these functions that have greater repertoire than just returning C by itself. It returns a whole set of possible Cs or a list of possible Cs or a, a maybe of C or, a, or a, a, a state involving C, a mapping involving C, et cetera. Okay, so here we have these, these um, uh, this Kleisley category. It's kind of an, an odd beast. Now watch this, this will, this may cause discomfort, disquietude. Ladies and gentlemen, our, I, every object you know in a category has an identity morphism, right? Um, so all these objects here, the ints, the, the bulls, the characters, the doubles, all of them have a, an identity morphism. That identity morphism goes from itself to itself and, and it's identity because if you compose it with anything else, you get that with any other morphism, you get that other morphism. Great, great. Um, so this identity morphism from A to A. Um, well, guess what? If you map that over here into the Kleisley category, that one goes into something from it's also from A to A, and I've, I've shown in these dotted lines, right? Um, um, this dotted line. But that's not this one. That, that's not this function. The, the function corresponding to this, this identity arrow here, this identity morphism, is actually this one over here, which goes from int to maybe event. Mm, it goes from an int to a maybe event. That's, that's what this identity morphism is here. And you would say, wait, that, that's evil, right? It's, it, it looks evil because it's, it's not even going back to the same, same value. It's going to a maybe event. If you go around it many times, you get maybe, 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 maybe. Um, so you might think. But remember, it's identity with respect to composition. And composition over here in the Kleisley category is not, not your old time composition. It's a special sort of composition. It's Kleisley composition. It's this composition that combines two functions of, of these sorts to get something of this sort. Um, uh, and it can do that. It, it, it knows how to do it. Amongst other things, it knows how to collapse an F of F of C to an F of C. So it can take, you know, uh, an F star, which goes from A to say maybe a B, and it can take a G star, which goes from, sorry, goes from A, so it goes from ints, if, if we make A ints, goes from an int to a maybe a bool, and it can go from a, and G goes from a bool to a maybe of character, and it can compose them with this special Kleisley composition that we'll be defining. It can compose them into something that goes from ints to maybe of characters. 
and could compose that. And guess what the identity is for that composition? Guess what the thing is, the arrow is, that's going to, if you compose it with any other, any other arrows, which it's compatible, it will yield that other arrow. That identity is exactly this morphism here. It's this morphism over here. It is the unit associated with the monad. Um, so here in the Kleisley category, we have this kind of through the looking glass version of the original, of the original category. This is kind of the original category sort of um, modified to support ubiquitous computational effects where each of these arrows is computationally effect bearing and where we can nicely compose these arrows. We can, we can knit them together in ways, even though they look incompatible, we can knit them together in ways that will, that will compose them nicely compose them in a principled fashion. And where the identity ones are, um, uh, are the identity morphisms are identities under that composition. They, when you compose them with anything else, you'll get that other, that, that something else, okay? Um, so uh, here we have a category that kind of reflects what we'd like to see, we, we'd like to transparently weave in computational effects to our program, be able to have every, every method we want to in our program can indicate uh, partial value, or maybe it can indicate probabilistic values, a, a distribution of possible values. And, and it will just plug it together, it will just work. We just nicely compose these things and and we get out the ability to perform computation that we had been performing on single values instead on distributions of values. Uh, we get this computation that we had been performing without taking into account possible failures. Um, and we can weave it together to a program that can handle failure at any place and record messages associated with that failure um, that, that might indicate its nature, the nature of the failure or the cause of it. Um, we can take a program like this and we can have all these functions that could return just one value before, we'll, we can modify them to, to allow any number of different values. Um, and that's what a Kleisley category is going to do. And how does that achieve that? How does it seamlessly weave this in? How does it achieve this, this ubiquitous computational effects wherever we'd like them in a seamless way, in a way that that allows us to focus on the job at hand for any one function, focus on the effects that can be generated by that function and not worry about the effects from previous functions. How do we do this? It's through the magic of monads. Um, okay, so that's, that's by, way of, by way of motivation, but the same set of, of, of examples we've been looking at with logging and with, uh, partial functions and probabilistic non-determinism and regular non-determinism, these are gonna be serve as kind of hallmarks or reference points, exemplars would be the best word for illustrating some of these otherwise more abstract concepts we're gonna to get uh, to in just a minute. And I've tried to do that for the Kleisley category here. Okay, so now back to the salt mines, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you'll recall natural transformations. Uh, we're gonna be relying quite heavily on them and I want you to remember what these were. So a natural transformation um, dealt with two functors. Um, it, it, we imagined a category C and another category D and we had two functors that went from C to D. Both have to go from same source category to the same target category. And what a natural transformation provided us was this really nice way of mapping consistently between these two functors. It told us that, you know, like these two functors, they may not have been the same. One might have been more coarse grained than the other, for example, mapped in a coarser grained way, but, but they were compatible in some sense. They, they, um, they, they had a sort of a, a, a similar structure. We could go from one to the other in this very well-defined principled way. 
and particularly we um we found that uh we had this nice feature associated with this commuting square uh, so uh if we consider how functor f mapped a versus how functor map g mapped a we would have a a link between them going from f of a to g of a that says you know how is a treated differently um, by f compared to g you may remember this from the example uh, spawned, spawned by Bartosz Mielewski's diagrams, right? We kind of map from the, the, the mouth of the dog to the mouth of the person, um, uh, or from the foot, from the arm of the dog to the arm of the person, or the hand of the dog to, the, well, sorry, the paw of the dog, uh, P-A-W, to the paw of the person, right? Um, uh, sorry, that, that didn't come out right. To the thing, to the hand of a person, the paw of the dog to a hand of a person. I'll get it right finally. Um, okay, so um, that's what these alphas are. That's those are the components of the natural transformation, and it's a natural transformation if it preserves this really nice property. That look, um, we can either perform a mapping of a function over in the first. Um, functor and then convert over or we could we could convert over to the second functor and then perform the mapping there we'll get to the same effects so you may remember this for example here maybe we have a safe head um and this had to commute this had to give the same thing that's why there's a check mark there um and and this is the naturality condition here we we can either go this way and this way or this way and this way we get to the same thing and the example I gave was like safe head. Uh, this is one of the examples, right? Where we we had a, a list of events and a maybe events, um, and uh, we uh, we have a function that's the f here, which is is negative. Okay, and there's a natural transformation between these. They 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 have enough similar structure. One is coarser, maybe only can say one or one thing, is it present or not, list kind of a whole set of things. But um, if we if we map over with this, we could take a list of ends and we could take its head first and get a maybe. Maybe it's empty, in which case it's nothing, is the maybe. Maybe it has at least one element, in which case it will give us the that element for the maybe event. And then we can ask if that's negative. Great. We ask if the first element is negative. Right? We could get a nothing because maybe the whole list was empty. That's that's a possibility. But otherwise, you get whether the first element is negative. Alternatively, we, we, we could take that list. We could classify each and every element in that list in turn with is negative. Say each element in that list, is it negative or not? Boom. We have a indication for that list in the form of a list of bools, whether each element was negative, great. And then we could take the head of that and we're guaranteed to get the same thing. We have to get the same thing. This is the nature of a natural transformation. In fact, all in Haskell, all parametrically specified uh, polymorphic functions are natural. They have to be parametrically specified, specified with one rule for all types. But in the theorems for free idea, they're all natural, okay? So, so we could go either this way or this way. And I pointed out at the time that points to an optimization, right? If you have this as the default path, you could transform it into this by just taking the head of the first and ask if that's negative and dropping the rest. You don't have to do a mapping over the entire list, even if it was writ were written that way. Um, uh, and similarly, we could have a maybe to list, for example, and and that will be nice. Okay, so these were natural transformations. And one of the reasons I hearken on this is because natural transformations are quite central to this issue of monads. And I want to remind you why. Okay, so the basic deal with adjunctions were that we had two categories, C and D. Okay. Um, we're going to have one category D be our main category. C will be Kleisley category. And there's a left arrow, a left adjoint between them and a right adjoint. K 
Okay, and the idea with adjunctions was that um, there's this fundamental similarity. Um, not to say they're the same, they're not exact mirror images of each other, but there's this fundamental similarity between them, these two categories. Um, so um, we, we have a guarantee that these HOM sets uh, are of the same value, of the same size. So let's, um, you, you may remember, this was the fun, uh, fundamental way uh, we defined, one of the two ways we defined uh, these these uh, uh, adjunctions was a similarity in HOM sets. So if we considered any two objects D and C, we map D over into, into categories, capital C, and we consider all the morphisms between that, that L of D and uh, the C we had chosen. That's got to be exactly the same size of a HOM set, same number of morphisms as are over here between D and when we map uh, R over here. Now, one of the things that that gives us is there's a guarantee, and you may or may not remember this, so I'm, I'm reminding you that there exists a, over here in this D category, that there exists at least one morphism from D to R of L of D. You might say, how, how could that be? How can we be guaranteed that there's exact one? Well, consider this. We map D over to LD, right? And then suppose we map immediately back with R. So we get R after L of D, okay? So we went L and then we went R and this is RLD. So we took D's image over here and then we, we, we took it back. So this is in the same category D because the right, adjoint goes in the opposite direction of the left. So here we have D and R of L of D, great. By the way, RL is an endofunctor. And in fact, it'll be the monad, but, but hold your horses. Um, so RL is in fact the monad, it'll be T. But, um, but this is RLD right now. And let's consider the connection between D and RLD. Well, look, we mapped it over and we mapped it to itself. Uh, what is, you may remember here, we had a C and we had a D. What is C here? Well, C is just LD as well. So we just chose a particular sclerotic version of this, a particularly sort of narrow version. We chose C equal to LD here. Um, so we just mapped back. We considered that mapping, but LD, if we consider now the morphisms between LD and C, which is itself, those morphisms, we're guaranteed to have at least one such morphism, the identity morphism. Every object in a category has to have an identity morphism. We know for a fact that there's at least one morphism between LD and itself, and that's the identity. It's the, the morphism, if we compose it with anything else, gives that anything else. So we know there's one morphism here. So there's got to be, by this rule, the fact that these HOM sets are same number as over here, there's got to be one here. And this one that's guaranteed is, is this eta, eta sub d. It's eta, we write in Greek letters for these natural transformations, just like we, we wrote, you know, alpha here. The Greek letters are assigned as a natural transformation here. Okay, great. Um, uh, and, and so this is a natural transformation um, from D to RL of D. And I told you RL is gonna be the monad, it's gonna be T. So this is actually an answer transformation from D. It takes, takes any object, any, you take something from D to RL of D. And you can think of it taking any element here and taking the, the monad on that element. That's going to be our unit of the of the monad. Um, so uh, this is an endofunctor. It went from this out, and and it reflects the fact that monad is is an endofunctor. Okay, so this is going to be our unit of the endofunctor. It's gonna it's gonna take like uh, an int, and it's gonna turn it into a maybe of that int with just. Uh, so it's gonna take three and turn it into just three. 
it's going to take uh, 15 and turn into just 15. Or that's for the maybe monad. Or if, if RL were the, were the list monad, it would take uh, a value three and would turn into a singleton list. Uh, it will take uh, a value of minus one and turn into a singleton of minus one. Um, if it were uh, a monad associated with the power set, it would turn into a, a singleton set um, consisting of just, just that element. So if we gave it three, you would give it a set of three. Uh, but if we gave five, it would give us a set of five. Okay, so, so that's what that eta does. It, it, it's gonna, it, it serves as this distinguished one and it's, it's gonna serve as the unit. Uh, so if we compose it with anything else in our Kleisley category back here, uh, we're gonna get the same thing back. It's, it's this one here, ladies and gentlemen, it's this one up here, this, this uh, identity morphism. Okay. Um, now, uh, natural transformation eta, it's a little bit wonky to think about because what we have here is a natural transformation which uh, involves two things. You could think of this as, um, as being a natural transformation between the identity functor and this T of D, okay, um, this one here. So um, every object, every object, every object in this category D has one of these eta's associated with. It. This is just eta for D, but we didn't show E. And there's an eta for E that goes to RLE. There's an eta for, yeah, you guessed it, F that goes to RL, RLF. Um, for every one of these objects, there's one of these. Uh, and it, it goes like this guy, RLD is mapping with this endofunk to RL, which I told you is, is T, T here. Um, and so it's, it's going to RLT, but it's coming from, well, we could think of it as just kind of the identity endo, endofunctor mapped onto these. So it's just, just D, it just maps D to D. Um, so, so here, it turns out there's a, a natural transformation. We can, we can either map it over, if we have a function that goes from, let's say D to C, from, from some D over to some other uh, object C, if we have this functor, uh, function here, lowercase f, we can either apply it on D and get C and then take eta of C. That would be kind of like we map it to a C here. We take eta of C to get to RLC, um, which is T of C. Or we can take D, map it to RLD, and then lift F, lift this D to C to operate on, on T of D. So it kind of reaches inside the T of D. This is like a list of int and and this is like is negative for ints, and it's gonna it's gonna operate on each element of that list. That's what this lifting is. It's kind of lifted this is negative thing to operate on lists, and we apply it, and we end up getting a, a, a T of C as well. Um, so either way you go around this, uh, it works nicely. So let's imagine that RL is list. Okay. Um, so, so imagine we have uh, some, some we, we have a RL's list, and so D is int. Uh, let's go back to that earlier example, float. Uh, float and bool, we'll do the float and bool, right? Um, float and bool. So here, this is float, and this is gonna be list of float. There's gonna be a separate one, C here, because um, we're gonna have a mapping here that's gonna be bool. And we have a function from D to, to, to that C, to, to bool. So of, of, of mapping from float to bool, that's called is negative. Great. Um, so that this is is negative here. And we can either go down with this, A to D. We could go from a float 
down to a list of float. Mm -hmm. This is gonna be a singleton list for, for Ada here, that's the unit. It's gonna be a singleton list of that float by itself. And then we can map it over with is negative by lifting it, by applying is negative to each element of the list. There's only one list, there's only one element. So it applies it to that and it gets a list of bool. That's what we get here. Alternatively, we could map this here. We have a float, we could map it with is negative. And the answer is no, it's not negative. And then we can go and call the unit on that to reject it into a singleton list of bool. That's gonna say, no, it's not negative. So either way we go around, we're gonna get a list of bool that, that is false, okay? So either way around, we're gonna get the same thing. And that's what this says. That's, that's why there's this, um, this is a natural transformation. All natural transformations go between functor to functor. Doesn't look like there's a functor, but that's just because we don't draw a, um, an, 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 a, an identity functor, which is mapping to itself. This is obviously a functor. It's, it's an endo functor. There's an identity endo functor here. And so it's, it's natural. This is a natural transformation. And uh, as it turns out that for all these monads, we have this nice natural transformation that's eta. So for a list, it's a singleton list. For a maybe, it's a just. Um, so we, we take an A, three, and we create a just of, of, of three. And that's our, our maybe. Uh, for a writer monad, where we might have a string in the first uh, component, here we just have an empty string. Um, uh, and whatever value of A, we, we give it. Um, so if this is three, this is going to be three, but it's going to be accompanied by an empty log. Power set, it's going to create a singleton set. Uh, probability distribution, it's going to give you a distribution where uh, the value you give, let's say three, has probability one of occurrence. Everything else is probability zero of occurrence. Either is going to give you right of A, meaning it's, it's like, uh, right on, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's got um, a success for that, that, that value. Either is used to indicate failure. It can be used to indicate a reason for the failure, like with an exception. Um, for the reader monad, uh, we can simply uh, take in uh, whatever environment and just return the value we've been given. And a state monad will just return its own state. It won't change the state. It won't, won't return a different state. It will take in a state and return that same state. Uh, we're gonna talk more about these, uh, some of these monads in coming sessions so you can understand them better, especially the state monad. Uh, but these are natural transformations for monads. They're things that take in a value and put it into a packaged value, an embellished value, an elaborated value, a generalized value but in a way that's principled, in a way that's, that um, it's not just any old value. This is a, a kind of special packaged value. It's a special embellished value. It's a special generalized value. Why is it special? Because this is going to have to compose. If you have this, it's gonna have to compose with any other Cleisley morphism, A to F of B in a way that yields that other Cleisley morphism. So, so this is our eta here. This is our eta. And this eta is going to, when composed with any other morphism, give back that same morphism, whether in either order. Um, uh, well, here you can only do it that way because they have to be lined up uh, um, uh, sort of uh, source to, to tar or target and then source. Um, okay, so um, uh, I won't go into this, but we'll talk about cone monads uh, at, at some point. And it turns out that the other natural transformation that's guaranteed to occur within a junction context is eta, excuse me, is epsilon. And epsilon is, is called co-unit. Um, 
and it serves as a coney and the and the and the comonad domain. Okay, so um, this is basically showing what I showed graphically that there exists um, with uh, a indeed a, an, an, a guaranteed to be an ADA going from this uh, to this. Now, um, uh, it, it bears noting that with monads, there's a set of triangle equalities um, that are going to apply to monads that give the monad laws. Um, so, but before we get to that, we're going to talk about this issue of, you may remember, back towards the beginning of this lecture, I motivated it with composition. And with composition, I said, what we need for a composition, we, we almost got what we needed by taking F and, uh, and, and post-composing it with the lifting of G, because F returns F of B. And if we could just lift G with, F, with capital F, with our functor, um, it'll then go from an F of B to an F of F of C. So that gives us a way that we can feed in the results of F into the lifted version of G and, and get out an F of F of C. But we need some way to turn that F of F of C into an F of C. And, and I told you a monad will do that. And now we're gonna see how, okay? And, and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it falls out of the adjunction and it's very practical uh, and it's many particular exemplars associated with this. It may seem strange, but it'll be just like you take a list, a list consisting just of any old list and you can flatten it with no loss of information to just be that, that inner list, right? Because it's a list only of that single thing. Um, or if you have a, a list of a set of singleton lists, um, you can join them together into something that's just a, a list of, of all those elements. Um, or maybe of, uh, maybe of, of something, um, a just of a, of, a, of a given maybe is, is simply that maybe value, for example. And we'll, we'll see how we can have these well-defined mappings from F of F of C to F of C in a way that plays nicely with this eta, which is the unit. Um, it, it serves as the identity there. Okay, so um, here's, the, here's the trick with, uh, with going from an F of F of C to an F of C. It all falls out of adjunction. It all falls out of adjunction. So with adjunctions, you remember that we have through the basic left and right uh, adjoints, we can map D to L of D and back to via R to R of L of D. That's what gave us our unit of our, of our monad. Um, over here, we can map, uh, if, if we start in C, we can map C to R of C and back to L of R of C. And by the same token, we're guaranteed to have an identity over here. So we're guaranteed to have at least one epsilon over here. And I told you that's the co-unit of the comonad. But here's the thing to pay attention to. Um, if, if we call this RL T, that's our monad. I'm going to tell you it's a, it's a monad. And it's a beautiful monad. Uh, RL is T. Okay, um, so T goes from D to D. It's an endofunctor in D. Great. Um, now, just compose, let's take T of T. Imagine, so T might be list, right? This is int and this is list of int. And now we're gonna consider a list of lists. Mm. Or maybe T is maybe. Those. I could leave out one of those maybes, I think. And so this is an int and a maybe event, right? Um, and now we're going to have a maybe of maybe, maybe of maybes. Um, or maybe it's, uh, you know, T is power set. Uh, and we're going to have int and a set of, set of 
possible ends, um, the set of possible subsets of ends um, down here. And uh, instead, we're going to have a, uh, a set of sets. So we're going to have a, a set of sets here. Um, OK, uh, so sorry. This is int, and this is set of int. And now we're going to consider sets of sets of ends. Um, that's what TT represents. Um, so, so don't get too confused by the fact they're written next to each other. It's like a list of lists. Okay. Um, and here, uh, if we if we compose them together, we get basically it's R after L, R after L. Um, there's a composition between the the two T's. So R L R L. Now the beautiful thing about it is that these two middle ones. We know how to re how to reduce those with epsilon to um, to identity. Um, so here we can take these RL and reduce it uh, to to identity. And and these outer RL um, they basically are just going to uh, these are are just preserving the current value. Um, uh, so this, these are uh, here uh, functors, um, and uh, we're going to have a natural transformation that is going to preserve R, preserve L, and take LR and turn it into, um, into ID of C, okay? And it turns out that composition of natural transformations, taking those things and sort of composing the natural transformations associated with them is going to give us this R epsilon L. R is really just preserving this functor here. Uh, L is preserving this functor there. It's, it should be, it'd be better to write as one sub R and one sub L. It's just preserving it. Whereas epsilon is reducing this to identity sub C, okay? And uh, uh, here, it, it turns out that this provides us with a way of going from the, 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 the purpose of this is to, to basically reduce LR to be identity of C. And this is a natural transformation from this to this. Uh, this is, these are functors. These are functors. This is the natural transformation I've shown in red natural transformations as compared to functors here. And basically we are showing a way to take this whole thing and turn it into this. ID of C is just going to disappear. We have C and uh, a, an ID of C is just going to be an endo functor goes from C to back to itself. It, it doesn't add anything else as a functor. So that can be reduced to RL. And so basically, this gives us a formula for, as a natural transformation, the, um, uh, this mu, which takes a list of lists and turns into a list, or maybe of maybes and turns it into a maybe, or a power set of power sets and turns into a power set. Okay. Um, so, so that's kind of what, the, what this natural transformation uh, does it, it it's simply this uh, this mapping so it provides this way to turn an f of f of c into an f of c um, in a way that what's produced through ADA will be the unit of this it will it'll be if we multiply anything times that if mu we call it the multiplication it turns a T of T into a T. It's like a bit of algebra. It turns a T squared into a T. Um, it, it, or it multiplies a T by a T. And if one of those T's turns out to be what's produced by eta, we get back the same, the other thing that we pass it by. So here's eta. Um, and I've, I've kind of shown this here in a, in a diagrammatic form. But um, uh, the essential thing is here, that we have this natural transformation. I've shown that uh, color here between uh, this on the one head and this on the other. And it turns out that 
uh, it's guaranteed to exist because this is guaranteed to exist. Um, the mapping of this over here is also guaranteed to have uh, a single linkage here by the properties of, um, uh, of, of uh, junctions. So the fact that this exists means the fact that their image over here, so you map LD over to RLD, you map LRLD here over to this one, RLRLD. And um, because the hum sets have to have the same number of, of elements between this and this and between this and this, the image of it has to have the same number as the original here. We're guaranteed to have one, and that's mu. Mu's job in life is going to be to serve as kind of the monoidal multiplication. It takes a T times a T and turns it into a T, okay? Um, and it's quite nice. Uh, this may sound terribly abstract, but it turns out for monads, it's very beautiful. So think about natural transformations here for different monads. So we have a list of lists and we turns it into a list. How do we do that? Mu is, is a nicely behaved one. It's given by this. This, is, this gives mu. Um, so with an adjunction, we always have this adjunction with the Kleisley category. Where's my Kleisley? Oh man, where's my Kleisley? Did I, oh, here it is. Here's my Kleisley. Um, uh, mu is, is, is this thing that's, uh, that's going to be defined in a way that allows uh, Kleisley arrows to compose into a general Kleisley arrow. It allows um, this uh, F and G to compose to this overall arrow from A to, A to C, okay? Um, and it's totally given by, by this, um, this formula. So we're guaranteed to have a mu. Mu is given by formula, given the adjunction, you can mechanically derive what mu is. Um, and this is join within a monadic context. This is our monadic join. It takes a list of lists and produces a list. And how does it do it? It does it a very specific way. It's not just any old way of composing them. It flattens the list, uh, the list of lists. So we have a list and it consists of a bunch of lists. Maybe the, it's a list and the first element of the list is a list of one, two. And the next element of the list is a list of uh, 10 and 11. We're going to, with apply mu, we're gonna take that outer list and we're gonna turn it into a single list. How are we gonna do that? We're gonna compose uh, or append the list one, two with the list 10 and 11. And we're gonna get one list, one, two, 10 and 11. That's how we do, that's what join means. That's what mu means. That's what mu means in the context of, um, in the context of uh, these lists. How about for maybe? Well, look, uh, we need to be able to turn a maybe of a maybe of A into a maybe of A. Well, you know, how are we gonna do that? Well, look, if the outer maybe is nothing, it, it's just nothing. Um, the, the result is just nothing. It's a maybe of A, the result is nothing. If the outer thing is just of maybe, we'll use that inner maybe, right? Because it's, it's just, this maybe of A, and uh, and we'll just use that, um, uh, and and that will play nicely. It turns out with um, uh, with the uh, uh, with the eta, the the injection into it, uh, the the uh, unit. So so this is how we perform this monoidal multiplication, this join for monads. For writer, um, we're going to take something which, for example, has a log for the outer value and as an inner value, which is a logged inner, inner value of, of maybe three. So we have a log the inside and a log the outside. We're gonna turn them, turn them into one log for that value three. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna append the logs. We're gonna concatenate the logs. Now, if all of this is starting to sound kind of familiar, 
it may be because some slides ago, we had exactly this. This is exactly what's going on here. Every stinking time we're, we're appending, we're concatenating this, these strings. Every time we were dealing with this nothing case, all of that logic has been abstracted into this multiplication, this mu. Mu captures this pattern. It captures this pattern so that we're not going to have to put it in place, okay, manually. We're not going to have to put boilerplate in place there. Um, okay, so uh, for power set, if we have a set of subsets, uh, we're going to turn them into one set to rule them all. And that's going to be the union of all those subsets, right? Um, great. Um, probability, if we have a distribution over distributions. So you may have seen this in the Paolo Peroni video, right? Um, where he had a distribution over coins. So he has some coins in his pocket and there's a distribution over grabbing one of those. And each of those coins has a different distribution of, of results. One of them is a, it's a normal coin, 50-50. And one of them is a, a loaded coin where it's 100% guaranteed to be heads. To call it loaded is because it had a picture of Queen Elizabeth II on both sides. Um, and and uh, those, that's a distribution over distributions. We're not sure which coin we're gonna get and we're not sure. And for each coin, you have a distribution of possibilities. And here, this distribution over distributions can be reduced to a distribution by just taking the weighted average of the inner distributions where the weights are given by the outer distribution. And if we have an outer and either, we can multiply that in the same way. Okay, now, um, so we have this mu. Uh, this mu is mechanically given. It's given for our monad in this mechanical way uh, by R, by L, and by this eta, which is, uh, which is, is given for this, uh, we, we know it exists for a given monad, um, uh, or given co-monad in that case. Um, uh, and we have this mu, which can combine things. It, it addresses the job of turning an F of C into an F of C. So it's gonna allow us to compose these because we already had figured out how we can get from A to F of F of C. And mu is gonna let us turn this into an A into an F of C, which is exactly what we want. We want to compose these things. F, which has computational effects computed for it. G, which has computational effects computed for it. And we want to compose them, capturing all the computational effects for each of them by having something that's from A to F of C. And that's what this join, this mu allows us to do. It allows us to take an F of F of C, turning into F of C, which is the final piece to allow us to engage in Kleist composition. F composed with G, getting us to something that's A going to F of C, not to F of F of C. We want this. Okay, so, so this is great. Um, you may recall that there are these triangle equalities that were associated with an adjunction. Um, and I walked you through some of the derivations of these in a previous session. Um, but basically we have these functors and we have natural transformations. Sometimes confusingly, they just write natural transformations from R to itself, uh, basically preserving functor R as just R. Um, and uh, we kind of came up with, there are these uh, adjunction uh, equalities. That for it to be a legitimate adjunction, it has to observe these equalities. Um, now, it turns out that if you take those, those give you the monad laws transparently. They just feed through to be the monad laws, okay? Um, and uh, it's quite, quite nice um, uh, how, it, how it feeds through. So here are the uh, adjunction rules. And it turns out that if you stare at this, you'll recognize that, okay, you, you have these and you can cl be clever and post compose this one with L. So everywhere we have something in these, in these uh, 
uh, nodes here, we, we post-compose with L. So we have L, you know, composed with L here, uh, pre-composed with L, pre-composed with L, pre-composed with L. And here we do the opposite. We post-compose with R, post-compose with R, um, post-compose with, uh, sorry, post-compose with R, post-compose with R. Great. And, um, and then it turns out that, wait a minute, R after L, that's T. That's the monad. That's our monad there. Um, and uh, so it is with, uh, with cases over here too. So we can re replace all those with monads. This is RLRL, so it's TT. Um, and, and this is what we get coming out. We, we get T, um, uh, we get, basically what this is saying is if you apply mu, as think of it as multiplication, monoidal product. If you multiply anything times the result of eta, this unit, we get that other thing back. Okay, um, so anything multiplied by eta is going to give that other thing back. In other words, eta acts as this monoidal unit when it comes to mu. Okay. And there's two different ways of getting, getting to this. Remember that here, these are um, functors here. So this is T after T. And there's two different ways of getting to that. One is we can insert a, uh, we can insert, so we should think of this as having an identity uh, functor here composed with T. And so we have A to operate on that gives us a T. And then we have T um, uh, preserving this T, we get a product of T's. And if we reduce that with mu, use job in life is to turn T after T into T, we get, we're guaranteed to have the same T here. That just falls out of these triangle laws for the adjunction. And the same thing is, is true uh, here. We're, we're here, we have uh, an identity functor on the right here. Uh, so it's T with uh, after an identity functor. And we can turn that one via eta into this T, et cetera. And it turns out that these different eta after T or T after eta can be um, thought of as kind of either lifting eta to operate in the eternal elements. Think of T might be list. And we have a list of these things we can take each element of the original list and we can call eta on each of those elements in turn. So maybe we have a list of one, two, three. And eta's job in life is to turn single elements into lists, right? And so we call eta on each of those elements of the list. We turn one into a list of ones. We turn two into a list of twos. We turn three into a list of threes. And we get out a big honking list of all those lists, right? That's what the T of T is. We get a list of lists. Oh my gosh. You know, we got this list of these singleton lists. One uh, the singleton list of one, singleton list of two, singleton list of three. That's what T of T is here. We've taken a, taken a list and we've applied data to each of the elements of it. Okay, great. Um, and now, I think that's actually this one. Uh, I'd have to think about this for a moment. But in any case, then we then we're going to apply mu. And what is mu? What is mu for the list? Well, it flattens it. It's just going to put those, all those together. It's going to take that list of lists and it's going to smush them all into one list. Okay, great. So we're, now we're going to have a list of one, two, three, and that's what we started with. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, alternatively. You could have applied eta to the whole stinking list. One, two, three. You apply eta and you create a list of list of a singleton thing that is the list one, two, three. And then you apply mu to that and you flatten it. Yeah. And you get back the same list as you started with. One, two, three. Same thing. You go either way. You get back the same thing. And that's what this long. So I didn't realize how weird. The convention was, but mathematicians like they love equal signs. They love writing equal, and sometimes they write equal with two long, long, long lines. This is what this is. This is an equal sign. Um, 
uh, and uh, this means this one equals that one. Okay, um, so there we have these two different ways of getting back, and it's the same thing with maybe. You know, uh, if you think about it, we can kind of insert it on the inside and get a, you know, a, a, we have a, a maybe of 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 int, maybe it's a just of three, and we can kind of go in on the inside and turn that three into a just of three, and we have a just of just of three, or or we could take the whole maybe of three and put into a, a whole the whole thing and stick it into a maybe as just of that maybe. And either way, if you then multiply it with mu, you take a maybe of maybe and reduce it to a baby, you you know, you got you got this maybe and and uh, the by the rules of that multiplication as shown here, you get back the original thing, maybe of three. And it's the same thing for each of these, for power sets and for state, et cetera. Okay, and so eta serves as the identity here. It, it serves as the identity. You, you um, are, are guaranteed to get the same thing back when you multiply by it with this, with this mute, with this join, okay? Um, like concatenating lists, that you append these lists, okay? Um, so uh, that's what's guaranteed by these monad laws. Um, if you take eta and you put it through, and I hope I've, you know, at least informally raised the plausibility of that to you. Um, you could work it through with power set or distribution. Um, the same thing. Remember with distribution, it's the Dirac delta function. It just says there's one thing that is total value and, and it's beautiful and it comes out either way. You can go either way and you get the same thing back uh, because multiplying on the left or the right by this result of eta gives the same thing back. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, and it turns out that the monad associativity law is given by, so this one final monad law, which is given by naturality square for eta. If you want to have a lot of fun, watch Eugenia Chung's uh, monad lecture number three or four, where she derives this under pressure in white heat. She, she just does this incredibly fast and, um, and uh, delightedly um, uh, discovers that it, it has to be true. So, uh, so here, uh, this, this looks <laughs> horrible. And uh, we have RL, RL, RL of D, which is T cubed of D. And it turns out if we reduce it either way, we can get to a T of D. And it basically shows associativity. Whichever way you, you reduce it, you, you're going to get back um, uh, to T, T of D the same, same way. So if you, this is associativity in the sense that if you have um, um, T applied to uh, T of T, um, is going to give the same thing as uh, T, T of T applied to T. Um, yeah, uh, enough said. So, um, so it turns out that comes right out of associativity. Um, uh, sorry, it comes right out of mo um, uh, naturality uh, associated with this. If we start over here with, uh, with this, we, we get this coming out. So the monad laws come out of adjunctions in naturality. Okay, they come out of the fact that in adjunctions, we are guaranteed naturality between uh, the two sides, and we're guaranteed as well uh, this, uh, the, the triangle laws. Um, and those provide us these monad laws. So uh, next time, I will be covering um, a little bit more uh, some of these monads and how they illustrate. So this one was maybe a bit uh, more emphasizing the category theory with, with the monads serving these roles to kind of motivate and, and uh, uh, appreciate what's going on. Next time, we're gonna talk maybe a bit more on the monadic side, uh, sorry, the, the software engineering side of, of these monads. Uh, we're gonna talk about bind. We're gonna talk about a join in that context. We're gonna talk about Kleisley composition, the fish operator. And we'll see how we can define monads 
in several different ways with different subsets of these operators with the confidence we can derive the other ones. Given us a certain subset of two, we can derive the other ones. So we can have join, mu, and eta, for example, return or unit uh, pure, as it's also called. And, and just those, we can define class decomposition and define bind, or we could just define bind uh, and, and uh, unit or return, and we can derive join, et cetera. So um, we'll, we'll concentrate a little bit more from the uh, software engineering side next time, um, but we'll use the category theory to kind of illustrate the principles of, of what's going on here. So uh, that's all I have time for uh, today. Um, I actually do have a little bit of time here before my next meeting. Are there any uh, questions anyone wants to ask about uh, any of this material or, or any of what I've covered in this list here? Nothing yet? Okay, well, maybe I'll be able to go get some lunch. Um, that's not a bad thing, and hopefully you folks can as well. Um, I know this is quite fast paced, um, uh, so thank you uh, very much for your attention. Um, I hope it does complement the videos I asked you to watch. If you haven't watched these already, please uh, please be encouraged uh, to do so. Um, I find watching them several times to often yield um, value on an ongoing basis. And Paolo Peroni's um, original video, not this one, but his monads and co-monads should make particular additional sense um, once you've absorbed uh, or gotten exposed to this sort of material. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, look forward to seeing you folks in the coming week. Thank you. And look forward to seeing you next week.